Hello everybody, good afternoon and welcome to this Aberdeen City Libraries virtual event for International Women's Day. We're just about to get started. There will be the opportunity to put your questions to Maggie and Gerda during the course of the event using our chat function and I will put those questions to Maggie and Gerda during the question and answer session at the end of the event. So, Thank you all for joining us on International Women's Day with a special Wild Women Poetry event with Maggie Gibson and Gerda Stevenson. It's wonderful to welcome you all here and help us mark the special day. Maggie and Gerda are well known within their field, fantastic poets, scriptwriters, play actresses and award winners. They have fantastic experience of performing their poems around the country, so I know we're in for a wonderful event today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Maggie Gibson and Gerda Stevenson. It's a delight to be here. Thank you very much for that introduction, Nicola, and uh, a pleasure to be hosted by Aberdeen City Libraries and to be sharing this event on International Women's Day with the wonderful Maggie Gibson. Uh, we're both published by Lewith Press, who are um, helping to support this, um, this event. I'm going to start with um, a poem from my book, Quines, Poems in Tribute to Women of Scotland. And um, this is this is a book about uh, it celebrates women from Neolithic times right up to the 21st century. So I thought I'd start with uh, Un the deep minded. She's also known as Odd and Odur. When you go back in time, it's interesting that a lot of these women have different different names. I liked the sound Un. Um, sounded like a kind of pebble dropping into a well and she was a well of great wisdom. She was born in Norway around 850 and died in Iceland around 900 and she was a Viking leader also as I said known as Aud and Ordur and lived in the north of Scotland where her son Thorstein the Red ruled for many years. And when I mention in this poem, the cat people, that's the people of Caithness. They were known as the cat people. And it's in several sort of uh, little mini, mini chapters, each one numbered. Un the deep minded. One. We have here all we need to leave this land. Oak and pine for the boat sealskin for rope and wool to weave a sail i'll not be beaten by defeat deep in these woods we'll hide till our knar is built now they've won the cat people will lie low while winter snow cloaks the fells and dales we once claimed and held but lost today we could have filled lochs and fjords with blood spilled these long years. It falls to me to lead the rump that lives. My mother always said new shoots can grow from a stump to sturdy limbs till acorns drop at last. My grandchildren must secure our line, but not through war. Change has found its time. Two, I mark the tide. We slip away at night unseen from Gill's Bay. No matter what the old laws say, I'm captain. Our kists carry my family wealth intact. Slaves row to my command. I've pledged them freedom. Hope spurs their oars at every stroke. Stroma looms, then Swona, our dragon's head bucks as we near the swelky whirlpool. But I tell my crew, I trust this witch who turns her wheel beneath our keel to grind the ocean salt. She drives us through. Three. My granddaughters bid me farewell 
one by one, waving from northern shores. I've wedded them to good men. This is my cherished plan. From Orkney to the Hebrides, from Pharaoh to my resting place, in the land of fire and ice, I'll braid for us an ark of lasting peace. 4. All is done. My grandson's wedding feast begun. In the great hall, Celtic men whoop their freedom with bone flute bird call. Drums summon dancers to the floor. But for me, no more. I take myself to bed. It's time to leave. I have here all I need. My boat will be my cradle in the grave. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, that was just a magnificent way to, to kick off International Women's Day for Aberdeen City Libraries and, and all of us in Scotland and beyond. Um, I mean, what struck me when I read this poem, I've had your, your collection, of course, since it came out, and when I reread this poem uh, to do this today, what struck me was you give us a whole life in this short sequence. Um, and some people would take a novel to do that. And we've just experienced that they're uh, sitting here together in our separate room. And you took us back over a thousand years and, and I had, you know, shivers going up my spine. But for, for this poem and for the whole book, for this poem, you must have had to do an almighty amount of research and to put that down. Would you like to say a couple of words about that research that you do? Thanks, Maggie. Um, yes, it, it's there was an awful lot more research than I kind of expected. I kind of had an idea for the book and then I started to look into how I would do it. I used the Biographical Dictionary of Scottish Women as a starting point, which is a fantastic book and everybody should have it on their shelf. It's just marvellous. Um, it's, it's published by Edinburgh University Press. So I used that. Um, I, I talked to people. I uh, started to buy books. What was interesting was that most of the books that I had to read uh, for to research this collection were out of print. And that tells you something about these women. Yes that, you know, that they are buried and neglected. Not all of them. I mean, Mary Queen of Scots comes into it, uh, which I wasn't going to, she wasn't going to. Um, but then I discovered something about her that I hadn't known that I thought was interesting and significant and spoke to me. So I did write about her in the book. But um, yeah, the research was, was huge, but also very exciting because I absolutely love history and I know Orkney very well and I could just imagine that journey going from Gills Bay, um, I've been to Caithness as well, you know, and that journey um, over the Pentland Firth, I mean, is just, it's incredibly difficult for anybody <laughs> in any century. And to imagine that she was captaining that ship as a woman um because all the all her people have been slaughtered in this last battle and 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 she has this vision of peace and she thrilled me as as somebody who had a vision of peace and that is why she was called un the deep minded she was a hugely respected leader and uh i just thought her uh, you know, she to ha to marry off all her family around this arc of islands to the to Iceland, and then she became the mother of Iceland. And so she was an immigrant, and I wanted to include immigrants because I think, um, you know, and emigrants. Scotland is who is here and who's doing stuff. Yes, and and you use language. Well, one of the things that struck me in the poem was the extent to which you use language of women. So you said that there, I'll braid for us an arc of lasting peace. And I love that you used I'll braid for us because I doubt a man would have used that language. So how aware, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you, how aware were you of using women's language and how much was that just because you're a woman, you use that naturally? 
I think it's probably more instinctive that I'm a woman and I use it naturally, to be honest. Yes. It's interesting when you say that, because I don't think I thought about that when I wrote that line. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, that's fascinating because I, I uh, saw that in this poem and in, in your other work. Um, I, I I did see see that happening. I had picked out a few and I can't see them on, on this one. But for example, when you are passing that, passage through the water that you're talking about you the, the swell keep it all pool I will you say but I tell my crew I trust this witch who turns her field beneath our keel to grind the ocean salt That's well, that was, imagery. well I, I just absolutely loved that story because that is a, a myth that belongs to that part of the sea that there is a witch down there and she's grinding salt which is which is um, why this becomes a whirlpool because she's doing this. And I just thought, what a fun, I mean, I just adored that story, that little piece of mythology. And I thought, let's bring that in. And Un believes that they can do it, you know? Yes. And I, and I said, well, I mean, I hadn't heard of Un the Deep Minded before. And I absolutely loved that title. But just about something which you did with the, the very start of this poem that I wanted to pick out is something else which I just, really absolutely loved with what you did with the, the first two lines the first line says we have here all we need and then you follow up with the second line to leave this land and i was so shocked it's just a brilliant opening we have here all we need to leave this land and that juxtaposition just jolted me so i i just wanted to see how much i admired that start to the poem Thanks. because i'm instantly caught what on earth has happened I do work a lot. I work a lot with juxtapositions in my drama as well. I think I love juxtaposition. That's definitely something I consciously use. But let's move on to one of your poems, Maggie. Now, thank you for that. Oh, thank you for the poem. Um, well, I'm moving us up to the turn of the 19th into the 20th century to another woman. And this woman is a photographer, and this, again, this is a short sequence, but I'm going to just do three of the poems from it. And this woman is called Margaret Watkins. She was born in Canada, but um, her, her father owned a, a store there, so they were reasonably okay off, but she hated Canada, and she hated domesticity. And she became a photographer in New York, which in round about the, the very start of the 20th century was quite an individual thing for a woman to do. And she was both a commercial photographer for magazines, um, you know, for adverts, and also an art photographer. And it's about some of her art photography, which really forged a new ground and what she did the photographs of, I mean, she did a lot of stuff, but this particular series, um, the second two poems I do are about photos that she did. The first one um, is addressing her directly. Her name, Margaret Watkins, the poem, the sequence and the photos were called Kitchen Sink. One, growing up in Canada, you feared not being eaten by a bear, accidentally shot by hunters gone berserk, or falling through the jagged ice of a frozen lake, but rather the horrendous thought of being domesticated to death. Years later, safe in Greenwich Village, you took aim at your kitchen sink, caught the light on its seductive rim, smooth, creamy as licked clean bone, zoomed in on the brass tap's root protuberance, its unleashed gush snapped and trapped its spumous rush on silver gelatin. Three. This sink's rolled enamel rim, sensuously curved like a lover's shoulder blade. Three hen's eggs, perfect ovals on a softly textured cotton towel. A sudden drop. Those eggs, brown, off-white, white, not quite. Metaphor for what? The ego of the artist, femaleness, fragility. Or might they represent the quickly ticking time bomb of your own fertility? 
such early morning stillness in this shot yet one tug on the dangling waterfall of cloth and oh this small domestic symphony would slowly roll and fall plop 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 into that aching gaping hole of black oblivion four did you wake one morning, blink weary at the sight of unwashed dishes from the night before? Sigh. Then, in a flash bulb moment, think, there's art in this, right here, this kitchen sink. Milk bottle, water filled, scum topped. A china cup, an unwashed bowl, rim chips, a striped milk jug, a soaking pastry brush, a file? That curious kettle spout, curved as an old tone's nose, peeping in at the photo's edge, gasping at the mess, while looming on the wall, the kettle's shadow, mad as a fat round moon, an evil twin, rocks with joy at what one critic outraged called this celebration of dirty housekeeping. And you exhibited at the annual salon as Still life composition, kitchen sink. Thank you, Maggie. Great, fantastic images. Yes, I, I, um, Margaret Watkins, I remember seeing um, uh, that photo um, at the exhibition at the um, National Galleries Modern Art, of Modern Art in the it, she was included I think in in that exhibition and uh, remarkable work isn't it you know it, it is and and there's there's a whole lot more remarkable about her her life after that and she actually gave up photography sadly at the age of about 45 but lived in her 80s and she never took another photo and she hid all her photographs she had them all in a box and then gave them i can't remember who it was to and, and with instructions not to open it until she died yes and she didn't and she didn't she didn't tell him that that's what was in this big parcel that was all bound in brown paper and uh, and, and sealed with wax on the string. And then he, when he opened them, it was Julie Holland of the Hidden Lane Gallery, discovered all these photos. And then he worked very hard to bring her photos back to the public. So there's kind of a, there's a great big story there, but I saw the photos that the Hidden Lane Gallery, I was kind of unofficial writer in residence there and wanted to write particularly about her making the domestic, the domestic, which had been so uncelebrated, women's work, and she was making it something you put in a picture frame in a gallery, and she did exhibit it at the exhibition, and the critic was outraged. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, and uh, I think that's, um, I, I thought that was worth well, I, I know the photograph, you know, in that uh, when you you talk about growing up in Canada, you feared not being beaten by a bear, by eaten by a bear, accidentally shot by hunters gone berserk or falling through the jagged ice of a frozen lake, but rather the horrendous thought of being domesticated to death. And I know those are her words. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, exactly. And then when you go into describing, um, you know, taking aim at your kitchen sink. I love that phrase because it's got a kind of double meaning there. And I can picture the whole photograph without actually seeing it, which is marvelous. I mean, you've you've created the photograph through words so vividly, which is is marvelous and not an easy, not an easy thing to do. It's uh, I, I love the language, the the um, the the light on its seductive the kitchen sink's rim the the seductive rim smooth creamy as licked clean bone i just love that yeah you... I, I think that the other thing was i hadn't actually done that type of poem before where you write from a photograph or an artwork so it was me writing myself a challenge. Um, jo Mulholland had been very generous to me in other ways, let me do poetry readings in the gallery and stuff. And it was kind of, I wanted to 
uh, repay him by doing some photos of some poems for the gallery. And I thought, oh, I've never done this before. Other people do this, they write two poems. So I, I kind of set myself the challenge of doing that. And I felt she was a woman who obviously had had, you know, we're on International Women's Day. Women are met by lots of adversity. She certainly met adversity uh, within the photography world. She met that, you know, man who was outraged by her taking these photos. She obviously met other things she was up against. She was one of only very few women in New York at that point trying to do that type of work. And she was a real individual, um, which is expressed in some of the other poems in that sequence. She was so individual. And then she came to Glasgow to look after, well, to visit, in fact, her elderly aunts. And then she got trapped looking after the elderly aunts. And she, she, uh, she felt in, she must have, one, she must have fallen in some ways into her worst nightmare because she then just stayed on in the house in Hindland. And uh, as I say, for some reason, at some point, just packed up all her photographic equipment. And that's what we are hoping in future young women don't do. Don't put away your pens and pencils. Don't put away your, your art uh, materials. Don't put away your dreams. Just keep pushing through. And so, I think what's, what's beautiful is that you in that poem, you've got this, this lovely sense of dialogue between an artist now and an, uh, you know, an artist then and you as an artist responding to her art. And it's, it's beautiful. And obviously as a woman, I mean, woman to woman as well. It's lovely. And I think you have a poem for us next, Gerda, which is about uh, an, another woman um, who is very much to be celebrated this year. Um, and you can explain that by, but who also got very rough, very, very rough treatment. Um, and it's wonderful that we are now in Scotland celebrating her. But, so tell us more. This poem, uh, again from Quines, is about um, Mary McPherson, who was known as Mary Vor Nanoran, which means Great Mary of the Songs in Gaelic. She was born in 1821, so this is the 200th anniversary of her death on Wednesday, in the week of International Women's Day. She was from the Isle of Skye, born in Skabust there, and she was a Gaelic poet, singer, songwriter, and she was the bard of the Highland Land League. She was uh, falsely accused of and imprisoned for theft. And it was when she was in prison, uh, in her 50th year, that she began for the first time to write poetry and song. And this poem is in the voice of song, Marivore's song. Oran, which means song. I lay inside her, a buried spring, rising drop by drop, the colour of her days in every hidden trace. The moorlands green and gold, waving summer innocence in the careless barefoot time, before the long trail of exile gathered like ash, and only the bone white bleat of sheep fretted the air. I lay there, silent but rising, for fifty years darkening at the black fear preached from the pulpit, churning at the lies spread about her stealing a slice of silk from her dead mistress. The shame of it, as if their ilk hadn't thieved her people's land, those masters of the sleek tongue she wearied of, that tried to silence her own. Buried still I was, but rising higher till, the iron bars of the prison cell closed on her and she stood alone, listening, as though the metal clang rang through her flesh and bone, summoning me. And I broke from her throat in anger's flood, a well of song that flowed and never faltered 
in its fearless cry for justice down the years. Thank you so much. Um, I really miss the fact that we can't all applaud afterwards, so virtual applause <laughs> from everyone there. Uh, I, I mean, it's the, the injustice is awful. But I thought it was wonderful that you give the, the voice of this poem to the song itself, the well of song coming up in our throats. Um, yeah. Did that come to you quickly, the idea of doing the poem this way? Well, throughout the book, the idea is that all the poems are in a voice. So they're either in the voice of the woman or in the voice of another woman who knew the woman in question or in the voice of her creation or her discovery. And in this case, it just seemed to me extraordinary that she was 50 before she wrote a poem or a song. And it was that terrible experience of just injustice that drew this from her and I was just imagining her in the prison cell and this voice emerging and it became such a powerful voice she used to um you know crowds would gather in Greenock and Glasgow where she would um where she would speak and sing uh, she was a trained midwife and nurse as well um, she, she had a very hard life. She moved to Inverness from Skye to marry a shoemaker, Isaac McPherson, and then he died and she had to bring up her four children alone. And then she lands up in prison briefly. It wasn't a long prison se um, sentence, but and unjustly, totally unjust. And then she becomes this voice for um, people who are evicted. For example, the famous Battle of the Braes in Skye, she became their um a, a voice for them where a group of men and women and children faced a force of police and soldiers sent by the government to evict them and they had stones that's all they had as their weapon and they had the voice of mari vorn and oren as as their weapon so she's a and given that that um scotland still faces massive land issues yes you know, over 50% of the land, the, of rural land in Scotland is owned privately. You know, she strikes me still as being a very important <laughs> voice today. And she is commemorated in the Scottish Parliament. She was in 2007 as being uh, one of the women who, who um, gave significant political voice and had an impact. Yeah, and, and, and so many, there are so many women like that in Scotland, and yet we, you know, certainly my generation, we weren't taught about them. I grew up, you would have thought there weren't, you know, there were virtually no strong women in Scotland. And it's marvellous you've done this book because, uh, and others, people like Sarah Sheridan, what she's done, and others are doing all of this because we, we really need for our, our daughters and granddaughters, they really need these role models, but what a fantastic woman. And the thing is, when you know a woman like this in our street, <laughs> <laughs> there was a woman that would go out there, you know, and, and she would do it. And I was lucky because my mother wasn't a woman that went out in the street, but she was a strong woman. She wasn't a woman who, who thought, I don't do anything. She was a strong woman. But there are such beautiful lines in this poem. Um, and, and I just want to pick up the moorlands green and gold waving summer innocence was one of the lines which I, which I loved. The bone white bleat of sheep was another one from when she is, is in the jail. Um, the lies spread about her stealing a slice of silk, all of that, just all those sounds just cutting in into me. And then those masters of the sleek tongue. Oh, I mean, that's just so powerful, Gerda. Um, and then the um, this fearless cry for justice at the end of the poem, and that fearless cry for justice, which we, we must keep listening to. Um, I, I, I think that there's, there's such, the, the other thing which I did want to say about this poem was, is the, the, the form, the way, the, the way this, the form of the poem builds up. It really does. It does rise, it rises the way you are. And I really admire the technical 
prowess in the way you uh, way you have written that. Well, I wanted it to kind of build up like water in a well and coming out, flooding out. And also I would say that sound is very important to me. I come from a family of musicians and I'm a singer songwriter myself. And so sound in language in my poetry is always very, very important. Um, I think that's true of your work too, actually. You're, you're, the sound value is very important to you as a poet. It, it and, and it's strange because um, I, I can't sing. I honestly cannot sing. And I remember years and years ago saying to the poet um, and my very close friend, Helen Lamb, and, his, and Helen was very musical for a musical family. And I said, Helen, I don't know how I, I have such a strong ear for, um, for, for the, the rhythm and the musicality of the, of, of the poetry. And, and she said to me, but it's not, your voice is a musical instrument. That's not what it's to do with. It's, it's my inner voice is very musical. Just because I can't harness it to actually <laughs> produce the song. And, it, and suddenly it fell into place for me. It's my inner voice is very, very, is very, very musical. Well, let's hear some more of your inner voice then, Maggie. Oh, we're, we're going angry again. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to end justice again. And it is International Women's Day, and we have to remember that for not, not just globally, but globally and here in the UK, there's still much injustice, which is why we have an International Women's Day. I was delighted to see that yesterday in the Observer, uh, the Observer, I think it's Observer and Guardian, are actually going to be doing a big um, campaign to raise awareness of what is now being called femicide, which is the number of women who are killed at the hands of men um, every year and every week in the UK, which is average out about three a week. And I've, this is something I have been very aware of for quite a long time. And this is one poem which I wrote about it. Dead women count. She counts dead women, not women wiped out in war zones by bullets and bombs, nor the 63 million missing in India. Rita Banjeri is, count, is keeping count of them, nor is she counting the Korean comfort women piecing together what's left of their bones from the fire pits where they perished. No, she keeps count closer to home but not the victims of wild-eyed strangers they drilled us to evade. Stay with your pals when you leave the pub. Don't walk down darkened lanes. Don't take shortcuts through woods alone. Don't get into vans. Don't wear too short skirts, too high heels, low cut tops. Don't end up a headline, a corpse, a break a mother's heart statistic in a ditch. No, not those. She is counting women killed with knives, shotguns, ropes, with septic tanks and fists, with poison cricket bats and fire, each killed by a man who said he loved her once, a boyfriend, husband, partner, ex, a man she trusted in her home, a man who thought her life no longer counts, but she is counting every week, everyone, and we are counting with her. Thank you, Maggie. It's a very powerful poem. And it, it, there's a kind of sense almost in it when you're reading it there of, of panic, of the terror. I mean, I think you, you evoke that sense of terror. It's to do with, it, you know, there's the, the, the the building up of the a kind of a sense of all those don'ts, but then moving into actually what happens, you know, the fear, and then this, it's it's shocking. I remember um, uh, seeing a, an extraordinary play, um, which was by a woman called Yael Farber, um, called Nirbaya. I don't know if you saw that, but it was about that terrible, terrible gang rape on a bus in Delhi. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the woman you mentioned here, Rita mm -hmm. Banerjee, I think she's called, isn't she? And she's, she's, um, and she's running this 50 million missing campaign. Yes. Um, you know, it's just shocking that 50 million women have been systematically exterminated. 
in, in you India. know in three generations in India mm -hmm. yeah and I think the thing is that it all become very um, it was invisibilized it's been invisibilized for generations it's been invisibilized globally and for what the femicide census, um, um, which the, the Guardian Strip Observer are now going to get on board with, looking more visible here in the UK. But the, I think, uh, um, I mean, I did blog about this, so if anybody wants to go to my blog, I'll be the last blog on, which has been there for well over a year. Um, the, 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 the femicide censuses, which have been in the goal, I think it was about 2012, 14, for quite a long time, they're just trying to make more visible in different countries. I mean, Canada has, I mean, every country's got a problem. Mexico, I think I read just yesterday, it's 12 women a day that are, are murdered. But with that particular poem, what had shocked me at the time that I wrote that was realizing that in the, the UK, the number of women who are killed by men they know. And that's, that, that just struck me. I thought when you're growing up and when you're, when you're growing up and with your with your your daughters you're saying oh don't do this and don't do that and you're not saying but actually you're, you're more likely or as likely to be killed by someone you've had a relationship with and that just blows my mind it really blows my mind and and also uh, you know i know that we're in international women's day here in the international women's day thing but the number of women who kill men is minuscule so when it starts on it's absolutely tiny 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 if you saw the paragraphs it's like that and then it's like that <laughs> so so um it's it really is an issue and it's an issue for men and women an issue we all need to speak of but once we've got an awareness once we can think about it then we could do this. I wouldn't say it was panic with me. I think that's what you call rage. <laughs> that is is rage. And I use poetry politically, and I use poetry. That's one of one of the ways that the ways that, um, that I use it. So that's why I wanted to read that. Uh, that's why I want. That's why I wanted to read that um, poem today. It's very powerful. It, it is. Celebrate when them. I say the pan, it's that thing of don't walk down darkened lanes, don't take shortcuts through woods alone, don't get into, you know, it, it's kind of uh, an awful kind of um, fear that, uh, you know, builds in that. And it's very, very strong. And it's so <laughs> true to all these things that we're told not to do as if it's our fault. Yes. And that's the other thing. It's also building that, uh, which is part of the control of women. So that's being used to control us, but in fact, that's not even the biggest risks to us. There are risks there, but they're not the biggest risks. And also, it's not us that should be getting spoken to anyway, is it? No, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, it's, it's just it's, it's another way of using um, poetry uh, is just to put across that as women, we can be angry and it's okay for us to be angry. We have every right to be angry. I mean, when I was younger, an angry woman was not seen as a socially acceptable thing. And I think that's something else that we have to just kick out of, the, but it's fine. You don't have, you know, all this be kind, forget be kind. There's a whole, there are a whole range of situations where women, young women, girls, no, you don't need to be kind. There's a whole lot of areas where, don't be kind. Be, you don't need to be cruel, but you have every justification for being angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's fine. Indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but um, but but let's move on to uh, your next poem, which will pan us all down because <laughs> it's a lovely uh, poem about a very intelligent woman and a woman who dealt with people who had lots of. Um, problems with their, their own, uh, what was going on in their own homes. So, Gerda. Well, I was thinking um, that, you know, during the pandemic, there's been uh, an awful lot of um, uh, coverage about mental health issues, which is, uh, you know, has it's been very, very challenging for many, many people, uh, the, the pandemic. And I thought it might be interesting to read a poem about uh, a woman who is a psychiatrist. She was um, Isabel Emsley Hutton. She was born in Edinburgh in 1887, where she later studied medicine. 
and she was brought up near the Ochel Hills. She died in London in 1960. She was a doctor and psychiatrist, awarded the Serbian Order of the White Eagle for services with the Scottish Women's Hospitals in World War I. That was with Elsie Ingalls. Um, Elsie Ingalls set up the Scottish Women's Hospitals and um, she worked privately um, at a time when the marriage bar made it impossible for women to practice their professions. Uh, the marriage bar was a terrible, infamous thing, which was lifted of officially in 1945, but still remained in place in practice. And it meant that if you got married and you were a professional woman, then you had to um, give up your work by law. And it meant that many women struggled to, to, to be part of a, of a professional network and to continue their life, you know, their professional work. And she was one of them, and she was a trailblazer in mental health. And I read her autobiography, which was just absolutely fascinating, um, out of print, of course. And she talked about this skull that she had been given by a, a gravedigger in the local graveyard when she was a, a teenager, just about to go to university. And she kept this skull all her life. And it was part of her, it was kind of an icon, it was, and it was useful for anatomy and they used it. And so I, I thought I would write this poem um, with Isabel addressing this skull. And the poem is called Skull. I'd entered the graveyard after church, my thoughts leaning from Genesis towards Darwin's take on events when the spade broke your rest among my ancestors. I feared you might be retribution or even a curse, worms churning the earth through clogged eye sockets. But my friend, the gravedigger, only laughed. Tack him, he'll be mere use at your studies than mouldering here in the bane thrang grun. The Sabbath air under the ochles brewed with coming thunder my mind with dread of parental censure. So I wedged you in a cleft above the burn and left you to the elements. All night through lightning flash, my pillowed head filled with you, a skull inside a skull. You hadn't budged an inch from your post that storm washed dawn. Rain had scoured you to pristine white, your benign smile a sure sign that no transgression had occurred. You were ready for service in another life. From the shadows of my haversack, your mandible flings its jaunty grin into old Ricky streets, a salvo at the lowering legacy of Knox and a silent rally to the fearful. You've given me a head start. I'm getting to know you. The perfect pyramid of each Petrus apex, the melancholy slope of your lacrimal bones, your entire compliance in anatomy class when we sawed off your vault to view the interior that once housed a whole world. Oh, lovely, thank you. Thank you very much again, uh, Gerda. It was a complete change of uh, tone and taste for us again there. Um, and uh, Skull, I love the fact that we go into this much more elevated vocabulary for this because she was such an educated woman. Uh, and I, I got the impression that you really enjoyed writing this and going into this different voice well i did i did latin at school i was one of the lucky ones that now it's no longer taught which i think is a tragedy mm. um and i loved the latin names for all these parts of the skull which you know i, I researched it to have you know because i didn't really know much about <laughs> skulls and anatomy but i felt i should to, to write the poem 
and uh, yes, I thought, and, and she gets to know this, she talked about how she got to know this, um, this skull. I found that very moving. I mean, it's a bit like Alas, Poor Yorick, you know, in, in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, and also what intrigued me about her was what she said in her autobiography, and I tried to bring this into the poem briefly in my mention of Knox, that uh, she says that children in my day were brought up on the maximum of Christian terror and the minimum of Christian love. It is indeed not too much to say that many Scottish children went through a mild conflict which might almost be termed religious melancholia before their first decade of life and that some carried their guilt and fears with them into adult life. And I thought that was very interesting and I kind of just touch on that, that this this skull is kind of throwing a jaunty grin at um, this, you know, from inside her haversack at, at um, at Knox and and all of that in Edinburgh but we should watch the time now shouldn't we um because we um we're going to have some questions but we yes. will have another poem from you um Maggie yes and uh and this is a, a short one again um so it's yeah this one is about and, and again it's about an object so um I mean we chose our poems kind of independently but it's the this one's about a lady's watch, which is in Glasgow Women's Library. So some people might have seen it. It's a lady's watch pendant. So it's worn round the neck and would hang just, I would think, the, between the breasts or on top of them, depending on how your bosom sits. <laughs> but it would be on the chain. And it's, it's about the size of a, of a, a, you know, a big marble if you played marbles when you were a kid. It'd be the size of a, a bull marble, as we called it and made of obviously solid glass. So the front of it was uh, the watch face is painted with yellow, tiny little yellow roses, uh, which was the American suffragist symbol. And it's back at the back of it is glass and you can see all the wee brass cogs and wheels and, and how they turn. Um, and from a distance, it would just look like a very feminine watch and the lady would be able to turn up and look at the time. Um, so I had to write a poem for it for stanza a couple of years ago, um, and, or for something from Women in the Library. And I thought, oh, I'll do, do it about this. And I decided to make it a riddle as if a man is asking what it is of the woman wearing it. So this would be just a girl, very early 20th century. The idea of these watches, there's another clock at the Women's Library too, is that the innocent person seeing it doesn't totally realize that it's for suffragettes or suffragists, that it's for votes for women. They don't get the symbolism right away. So, they, so I made the poem like a, a riddle and it's a gentleman asking a lady what it is that she's wearing. I called it, so it's a riddle. Tick tock. She says glass. He thinks fragility. She says pretty face. He thinks lady. She says delicate hands. He thinks femininity. She says roses yellow. He conjures up a scented garden, bird song, a summer evening while she imagines a sisterhood of suffragists blossoming. She says, cogs and wheels that click and spin with beautiful efficiency. He thinks, clock. She says, yes, but no. She's got in mind a different kind of movement. He fails to grasp just why this makes him laugh. She wears a timepiece with its secret message dangled in a chain between her breasts, a shiny globe of polished glass, a tiny ticking heartbeat of sedition. Oh, it's brilliant. I love it. I love the whole idea of the, you know, the riddle. 
and the different interpretations and that last line is just you know it's great you know a tiny ticking heartbeat of sedition it's just exquisite and of course he can't look too close because he can't look at the <laughs> I, I love the way i mean it, in another uh, poem in your book the one about your mother during the war which is a fantastic poem and so moving where you des describe you know finding that the ring and you describe the exquisite detail of that i mean you've got all of that in this poem i love the detail the you know the the exquisite um aspects that you you create so beautifully um well the truth of the matter is i wrote i first of all for for that uh, as i say it was a commission and i first of all wrote the most heavy-handed poem you could imagine <laughs> <laughs> and i thought oh that won't do and i quite often find that happens with me i do something and i think oh god it's just i don't like it at all you know and i have to kind of almost Keep myself with a scruff of the neck and give myself this really hard shake and say now do it properly i'm the i'm the same it's interesting i mean i go to so many drafts do you do you do, oh, go yeah. to a lot of drafts lots of drafts yeah yes. So do I. yes and it's to get that um when i did my book launch with ali whitelock and i spoke and i think ali's here hello ali <laughs> and i and i spoke about trying to get a lightness into poems sometimes and working hard to get lightness and i think TikTok has that lightness in it i don't try to get lightness into something like dead women count because i want dead women count to go wham <laughs> like that mm -hmm. but that one TikTok is a really good example of me trying to whip a, a kind of lightness into it um in into the lines and, and with the war shadow the, the poem the long long sequence about my mum um and thank you for for the compliments for that it means a lot to me um i really wanted to get that it had to be a light touch it had to be done with a light touch because, partly because the subject matter in that one is so so heavy um and uh, and it's trying to get that lightness in it can be very very hard indeed yeah so it takes lots of drafts yeah mm -hmm. do you think we should now um open it up to some questions because um i think we had we had more poems planned but um the conversation has been in, enjoyable and uh, uh and maybe we can involve the audience in that what do you think maggie indeed yes well, hello again then, ladies. <laughs> We've had a few um, questions come in over the course of the event. And before I get any further, also uh, lots of lovely comments. Like Maggie said earlier, it's so strange sitting in a, a setup where you can just applaud. So on behalf of everybody who is currently muted, the applause because we've had lots of wows, magnificent spine tingling. We've got a couple of questions and I'm conscious we're starting to run tight for time. So I'll start with Olga's question, if I may. And her question is, how do you feel about all these inspiring women whom we know so little about compared to their male contemporaries? And I think that's for both of you. Well, um, what do you, do you want to go, Maggie? Oh, well, you go first, Gerda. Well, how do I feel about them? I feel inspired by them. And uh, what was interesting about writing my book Coins about all these women is that it didn't feel like it doesn't feel like my first poetry collection, which is much more personal and um, autobiographical. I feel um, that, uh, you know, I feel very moved that um, I am in a position to, you know, bring these women to attention and uh, that's that's what I want to do because they are definitely equal to all the men we know about. I, you know, what else can I say? I think that they are uh, they, they they have completely blown me away with what they've done. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're they're obviously absolutely amazing, and it's such an I mean, this word injustice just keeps coming back to me all the time. I spend so much of my time with this word, and and not just this word injustice coming to me, but this word injustice being said to me by other women at the moment. I think we're living through a time of great injustice being done to women on a lot of fronts. I think that we're being it's being done so much. We're not we're not through it by any manner of means. I think we're living in a backlash against women at the moment. I think we're having to fight even harder 
anyone who thinks we're not, I think is not really awake to what's going on. And it's brilliant that, as I said already, that, 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 that people are, um, that there are so many women who are working so hard, like Gerda and uh, other, other women that I've mentioned, are working so hard to keep pushing through and keep pushing through because I think um, Caroline Criado Perez would, would spring to mind amongst writers as well. It needs to keep, we need to keep doing this. Any notion that we can, that we are totally making ground is wrong. We're not. And the women from the past, we, I mean, I've written a fair bit about poets on my blog site. It has been hard for, I would say, for my generation of women, it has been quite a hard push to come any, to come close to parity and I, with poets. And I don't, I think anybody who thinks isn't should read my blogs. <laughs> so it has been, and it's not, it's not the fault of the men. That's not what we're talking about at all. It's just the way canons work. They get dropped out of the history books and the biggest and best example of this was the, the Field Day um, anthology in Ireland, where a perfectly nice man, whose name I've forgotten, <laughs> there's some right, <laughs> managed to put together, and this was in the, I think, the late 20th century, I don't think it was the first, late 20th century, managed to put together a whole anthology of Irish poetry and left out virtually a I think almost every living woman poet. I mean, it was just, but he was a nice man. He wasn't mean and bad. So that's all I'll say on it. It's just the way it works. So we need to just keep pushing. Fantastic. Um, and Olga says, thank you so much for answering that. <laughs> um, a question from Diane. Diane wants to know to both of you, Maggie and Gerda, if you consciously choose to write in Scots, Gaelic or English, or do you find that the poems just naturally choose their own language? Definitely. They definitely choose their own language. And I, um, I think there's an awful lot of politicisation of language that goes on, which, I mean, I think I can understand why. I'm married to a Gael and I have absolutely fought to get my son um educated in gaelic and to be fluent and literate in the language and i am so aware of um the incredible prejudice in relation to language but at the same time as a poet i i i do get slightly annoyed when people um you know assume that oh the, oh she writes in scotch she's made a choice to to really push the scots language it doesn't work like that creatively for me at all not at all. The voice comes, you know, my poem about Mary Queen of Scots, she just she just speaks um, in Scots because that's the way it came. And I couldn't possibly have imagined the poem in another way. And it's a lot of a lot of is it in, of it is instinctive in um, the creative process. You get a smell of something, a sense or maybe a word or a phrase. And then it and then the poem comes and it comes in a voice. You know, it might be your voice, it might be my voice, it might be, you know, any voice, you know, so, so it's not a conscious choice, but I'm very glad to have, uh, I mean, I can't write in Gaelic, I'm, I'm not, I understand a good deal of Gaelic, but I'm not a, I'm not a Gaelic poet. I've used a few words of Gaelic and a little adjustment into Gaelic syntax in some of the voices in Quines, where it's a Gael. Um, I do, um, I do write in Scots fluently. I was brought up in the Scottish borders in a village where I heard Scots spoken. And um, my father was a composer pianist who used, um, who, who set a lot of the uh, Scots language poets, um, poetry to music. So I grew up with, you know, knowing Souter and McDermott who lived down the road and used to come to visit the house. And so Scots language was very much part of my consciousness from as long as I can remember. Um, so I'm very, very lucky to have access to English and Scots is how I, 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 I see it. Well, I, mean, I, I agree pretty much. I agree very much with that, but I've still not accessed my Scots that was educated out of me. So I, uh, uh, I, well, I have, I mean, I've got a couple of poems in Scots and one is about moving as about how the Scots get educated out of me, a poem called An Education. <laughs> and it starts in Scots and it moves 
listen to English. Um, and I'd like to, I've, I've just recently translated lawn poem, uh, Wild Woman of a Certain Age, into Scots, and it sits beautifully in Scots. And uh, I will be doing something with that. But great, great. Uh, <laughs> my, my granny and grandpa spoke in Scots, very broad Scots. So I know it's in me. I know it's in there, but my mother was um, quite rightly uh, being from a very, very working class background. My mother was very aspirational for us, as was my very working class primary school. So they, they meant the best for us. And it was uh, it was very disapproved of um, at home. So it was it was kind of educated out of me, although I spoke it with my pals and things, and just over the years I've, I've lost it. And well, that is, it's there. <laughs> oh, listen, Maggie, it's it'll be there. It'll it'll be in such a deep way. It'll be there. I mean, it's there's no because uh, oh. not many people know this, but I actually studied languages, so I'm actually a fluent French speaker. My German's in there too, but it's a bit lost as well. <laughs> but, but my Scots is definitely there. I mean, it's it's you know, it's it's it's, it's deep in my heart somewhere. So I, I will be doing some work to see what I can find. But as you say, the poem comes the way the poem comes. So it's, I don't, I'm not going to overdo it. When they just tap you on the shoulder and ask to be heard and written down, they choose their own language. That's right. Indeed. That's fantastic, ladies. Thank you. I'm very conscious that we're now starting to get tight for time. So, and Diane just wanted to say thank you so much. She's so chuffed you answered that question as well. Um, so unfortunately we're going to have to make this the last question and it's from Renita and she would like to know and I put it to both of you although Maggie I know you set up the Wild Women writing workshops but I'm, both of you will be able to answer this I'm sure. Renita wants to ask she would like to know how do we go about how would we write about our mothers and others so how can we who are not poets like yourselves how can we go about writing about our mothers and others. Other inspiring women, I'm guessing she means by that. I'm should be putting words in your mouth, Renita, sorry. <laughs> you go, well, Mike. Well, I, I think I think with um with anything like that, it took I mean, this isn't very helpful, Renita, but it did actually the idea for writing the sequence I did write about my mom had been living with me for well over 20 years that particular sequence some of the images in the sequence like the fact that my mother wore two wedding rings which rubbed against each other because the gold is soft and they were rubbing each other away um and one of them eventually actually split and broke so it had to be taken off that that uh, i remember mentioning that to the poet alan spence in the late 90s so the, but i actually only wrote the sequence in 2020 and i kept just thinking i knew all these things and i wouldn't have written it until after mum had died that was the other thing and she died in 2000 yeah. at the very end of 2009 you can see how long it has taken me to tackle that and it was very i also have a huge problem about how i come at writing about people who are other people who are not me um, the only way I can ever write about anyone like I've written about my father's um, Alzheimer's and the only way I can write about whether it's my mother, my father or anyone else is to write it from my perspective, my experience of it. So I don't know if that helps. I can only be witness to me and that's what the war shadow sequence is about. It was the war, the shadow of my mother's experiences of the war hung over my childhood. And I, that's, that's my only valid position, something that's too personal to her. And that's the only way I can do it. I know other folks do things differently, but that's the only way I can, I, it's the only way I can feel valid in doing it. So I don't know if that helps, but also just don't go there if it's not the right thing to go there. Just have to wait, and, and you just have to go in at whatever angle you can, and keep it absolutely private to yourself. No one else ever needs to read it. It doesn't have to be. I I only went with mum's that sequence. I only went because I met so so many people over that two decades when I didn't write it. I met so many people who told me their own stories 
about what had happened to their own, often, most often mother, but some occasionally father, during the war, which had sat like a shadow over their own children. And I just thought this is a, it's personal, but it's universal. And I wanted that. I think baby boomers, we get a lot of bad press, but there was actually, we actually got a fallout from the Second World War. <laughs> and our parents were just the most amazing people. So, so I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Is there time for me to answer or do you think it's fine if we've, we're running, running out of time now? We're running a wee bit over, but no, absolutely go for it, Gerda. I mean, this is the last question, so I won't ask you anything. I think that, um, yeah, I think personal experiences, I think uh, in my experience as a writer, you do have to get some distance from them before you can start writing about them. I think it's difficult to write about them if you're absolutely in the maelstrom of a, a big emotional event. For example, I think it's, I can't do that. I have to wait till I'm distanced from it. And it's often, sometimes years afterwards. Um, but when it comes to writing from an, another point of view, I think probably because I'm an actor yes. and trained as an actor, I am absolutely conditioned, if you like, to um, uh, to, in, to getting into somebody else's head because that's my job. Um, and so um, it involves a huge amount of research. You know, you don't just kind of imagine yourself in another, you know, you, you try to research the and create a biography of your character if you're playing a part in a play. And that involves a huge amount of research. So um, I would say that, um, yeah, I mean, the other aspect also is that I have plundered the lives of my family. <laughs> <laughs> in some ways that sometimes have been questionable and I've had to ask for permission and there has been some reluctance yeah. and um, you know I've kind of gone ahead and then actually in the end I mean I wrote a, a poem which then became a short story and then became a play and when it was the short story it's actually my husband and it's to do with his mother's death and all of that which is a very fascinating kind of complex story i mean he wasn't very happy about it and wasn't sure about it at all and then it became a radio play and when he heard it on radio he loved it and i don't know whether it was to do with getting the distance of or or suddenly when it went into a public space which kind of what is what he was worried about suddenly he absolutely because it wasn't unsympathetic it was empathetic but these things are complex and i think you do have to kind of get permission uh, you know, you can't plunder people's lives without permission. I mean, I was nearly without permission, but I kind of, it was okay. <laughs> I think one has to be careful and sensitive. And, and when I've written about other people's lives, uh, you know, I've done a lot of radio drama for, um, uh, um, you know, about refugees, homeless people. Um, I've protected those people fiercely and changed their stories and been extremely careful because you cannot, uh, you can't use people, you can't exploit people as a writer. I passionately believe that you have to be responsible. But when it comes to your own emotional experience in a relationship, I think I have to get some distance from it before I can write about it. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that you can also I usually say in my workshops is it's entirely up to you as to whether or not you even with even with poetry you you can fictionalize and it's up to you whether you tell people what the truth behind the poem is so you you always have the option of framing the poem the way you want to frame it so um, so I think that's I think that's the other thing you, you frame it as you you are the writer you are in charge and nobody what you're going for with a poem is the emotional truth of the poem not the factual truth of the poem and if this is something you really need to write write it and go for the emotional truth of the poem you don't need to tell you own you owe your reader nothing really when it comes down to it except the emotional truth of the poem 
you don't need to tell them you don't need to write your right story you, you know you don't need to do interviews and tell your life story i think sharon old too is quite an interesting example to look at she wrote stag's leap and then she didn't publish it till i think it was 15 years after her husband had left her and left her very unhappily and stag's leap is about him leaving so as a po in, po in terms of poetry i think sharon olds is a very very interesting example she is because there's incredible detail there you know like the the thing in the washing machine when she discovers that little um you know uh, uh is it the name i can't remember exactly but you know she in, in the clothes and it's you know the other woman and there's lots of incredibly personal detail in that and she wanted it's her children brilliant. to be that bit older again i think and it was just to do with her having I mean, children were old, old enough that she just wanted to give them that extra bit of space. So she chose. So it's about you. You as the as a poet, as the author, you have you have ultimate power, and remember that. And you can leave it in your notebook, and no one has the right to open your notebook or read it. No one, absolutely no one. My one, one, no one, one of the best. One of the best poems about mothers is by Ellen Bass, a wonderful American poet. I can't remember its title right now, but her her poetry is just absolutely in, incredible. The Human Line, I think, um, is is um, is one of them and uh, one of her collections. But she is really worth looking at. She's just got the most stunning poem about her mother and her mother's death. It's just it's so brilliant. Wonderful, wonderful writer. Yeah. So I, I hope that's encouraged everyone who's, who's writing to actually just do what you like and <laughs> don't have to explain yourself to anyone. <laughs> and when that urge is on you though, because you're thinking, I want to go and explore this in my writing, go and explore it. And there's a there's a bin there, the bin, just, you know, or, or an open fire, just put it on. You know, you don't know, it's not best not burn anything, but, but you know, it's really between you and the page at the start, because you just don't know what you will produce or where it will go. So just um, give yourself permission. And I don't know that women are as good at that, at, at that as they should be. So give yourself permission and just see what happens. But you don't need anyone else. You're a grown up. <laughs> <laughs> And I think that is the perfect point to stop it on. Give yourself permission. I like that, ladies. We have run over, but it has been fantastic. And I'm sure, as everybody can see from the chat, people have loved listening to you. Um, on behalf of everybody who's attended today, thank you both so very much um, for talking to us. I want to give you a round of applause because everybody else can't but you'll see from their comments how much they've enjoyed it and how much they've enjoyed your perspectives and the people you've introduced us to and the poems you've introduced us to and the concepts um and there's plenty for everybody to take away from today so maggie gerda thank you both so very much to all who've attended today thank you so very much for giving up your lunchtime and joining us to mark international women's day with such a fantastic event and to wonderful uh, poets um, thank you to my colleagues at Aberdeen City Libraries for helping organise this and to Lewis Press who, for their help today with the tech and getting organised. Ladies, thank you so much. Um, Maggie and Gerda's books are available from their publisher, Lewis Press, um, from bookstores and of course from your local library service. But until we can meet you again, hopefully in the not too distant future, in person or at a future virtual event, all I want to say is thank you all very much for giving up your time today. Thank you for joining us. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you.